Welcome to CS320, Chapter 23, where we're going to talk about Turing Machine Languages. So we have two new definitions uh, or classes of languages. One is called recursively enumerable, and we'll abbreviate that with a lowercase r and a lowercase e with periods, and that's just so you don't confuse it with regular expressions. The other language is called recursive. And of course, when we have a Turing machine, it has its language and it accepts all the words in the language. So the words in the language are the words where a Turing machine will land in the halt state. And that's true for both of these. Now the main difference is what it does to reject words that are not in the language. In a recursively enumerable language, it has two ways to reject it. The first way is to crash. So whenever a Turing machine crashes or perhaps lands in a reject state for a post machine, that word is not in the language. It's in the complement of the language. So L prime means all the words that are not in L. So if we take all the possible words we could come up with, some of the words would be in the language and some of the words would not be in the language. And the Turing machine would crash on all the words not in the language or it might loop forever. And as you can see with the uh, non-deterministic Turing machine that we simulate on a deterministic one, that it might loop forever on a lot of words. Now with recursive languages, it has to crash on the language itself. It cannot loop forever, or it has to crash on all the words that are not in the language. And it will never ever loop forever. So this is a little bit nicer to work with. When we put a word on the, on the tape and say go, we know that the Turing machine will eventually either halt, accepting the word, or crash, rejecting the word. We know that it will never get in an infinite loop. Now getting into an infinite loop is a little bit hard because we don't know if the word's accepted by the language or not because it could just take another year for it to get to the right answer, or it just might be in an infinite loop. Now, we'll discuss later on if there's a way that maybe we can analyze this Turing machine and figure out if it, if it will get in an infinite loop or not, or something like that, because, well, maybe we could see that it's just going on and on in this circle and there's no way to break out. We'll see if there's something that we can do about that later on. So anyways, we have these two classes of languages, recursively enumerable and recursive. Now, hopefully you can uh, see that all recursive languages, by definition, are also recursively enumerable because it rejects all the words that are not in the language. So that meets this definition. It's not like it has to loop forever to be recursively enumerable. It just can loop forever on some of the words. So all recursive languages are also recursively enumerable. All right, there's a couple of really important theorems that deal with recursive and recursively enumerable languages. And we, these theorems are going to help us answer the question of what are the limitations of a Turing machine? Can a Turing machine define all languages? And so these uh, theorems are actually really important. And the first one is theorem 60. If a language is recursive, then its complement is also recursive. So again, being recursive means that we have a Turing machine that accepts all the words in L and crashes on all the words in L prime. Now we're gonna explain this using a post machine. We could also explain it using a Turing machine as well. It's just a little bit easier using a post machine. So if L is recursive, then there's some post machine that we can make that will accept all the words in L and crash in all, all the words in L complement or L prime. Okay, so let's call this post machine P. So first of all, we're going to take all the states um, that is, say that go to accept. So we're going to take all the states that go to accept. We're going to cross out the word accept and make it reject. Okay. And then we're also going to take all the states that say reject and cross that out and make it say accept instead. 
Then we're going to take all the hidden crashes. You know how a post machine might crash if there's no edge to take for the given letter that it might be reading? Well, we're going to add all of those, uh, reject all, all of those states back in, and we're going to make them go to an accept state. So essentially what we're doing is we're reversing all the accepts to become rejects and all the crashes or rejects to become accepts. And now we have a post machine that accepts link L complement or that complement of L and it, it accepts all of the words in L prime it rejects all the words in L and it loops forever on nothing because the original machine looped forever on nothing. Now let's talk about theorem 61 that says that if L is recursively enumerable and L prime is recursively enumerable, then L and L prime are recursive. Now this part obviously comes from here because if L is recursive, then we know that L prime must be recursive as well. So if we have two uh, or one language that's recursively enumerable and we know its complement is recursively enumerable, then we know that both languages are recursive. And the way that we're going to prove that is we'll, we'll have L um, be accepted by some Turing machine. I'm going to call it Turing machine 1. Okay, now this is recursively enumerable. So what that means is that it accepts L and that it either crashes, and crashes is a reject L complement, or it loops on L complement. Then we're gonna take, uh, there's some other Turing machine, for we'll call this Turing machine two, that accepts L complement. And what that means is that it accepts L complement, and it crashes on L, or it loops forever on L. And I made a little mistake here. It should crash on L, not L complement. Okay, so now to prove our theorem, and we know these two Turing machines exist because their languages are recursively enumerable. To prove this theorem, we're just going to modify this Turing machine a little bit. We're going to take all of the crashes right here and we're going to change them to loops instead. Now, if you recall, a Turing machine can crash in one of two ways. It can move the tape head off the left end of the tape, and that causes a crash. Or we could be in a state reading a letter, and there is no edge to follow for that letter. So what we do is we add a, a symbol or something on the very front of the machine, that will replace the fall off the, the left edge. And then whenever we read that symbol or whenever we're in a state that doesn't have an edge to follow, we're gonna create new edges that go to a brand new state that's kind of like our loop forever state, okay? And then this state, whatever it reads, it will write the same thing and keep moving the tape head to the right. So basically it's an infinite loop that just keeps moving the tape head down to the right. And all of the previous crashes, even falling off the left side of the tape head, because now instead of falling off, we're reading a character that doesn't exist in our alphabet anymore. All of those things will go to this state and will become, go into an infinite loop. We're gonna make one more change to this uh, second Turing machine, all these accepts. We're gonna get rid of these accepts and we're gonna turn them into rejects. And the way we do that is we take all the edges that go to halt states that would accept the word and we just erase them. So now it's going to crash on all the words in L complement, okay? And in this case right here, it loops forever on all the words in L. We're also gonna make one slight change to this Turing machine, the same change that we made right here we're gonna take all of the crashes and turn them into loops. So that way it loops forever on all of the words in L complement. Now what we can do is we can create a new Turing machine. We'll call this Turing machine number three. And this new Turing machine 
we'll be, could use two tapes to do this. It's kind of easy. And we copy the input word on both tapes. And then it runs one step on uh, this uh, of this tree machine, and then runs one step on this tree machine. Then it does a step here, then a step here. So it's kind of running these two machines kind of at the same time, much like a single CPU is multi-programmed to run multiple programs at the same time. And eventually, it the machine, this tree machine three, uh, if tree machine one accepts and halts, then it is accepted the word a word in our language. So if it is a word in our language, eventually this tree machine will accept it. If it's a word not in the language, then this tree machine will crash and reject it. Now tree machine number three is now a tree machine that accepts all the words in L and rejects all the words in L complement. Thus, L must be recursive. And since L is recursive, we also know that L prime is recursive because of theorem 60. All right, now there are two other theorems, and I'm not going to go into the proof of these in too much of detail. But basically, if we have two languages that are recursively enumerable, then we know that their union is also recursively enumerable. And if we have two languages that are recursively enumerable, so is their intersection. And it basically boils down to the same idea that we use in this theorem of running two Turing machines at the same time. We do a step on this Turing machine, then a step on this Turing machine. And that's actually for theorem 62. So we one step from the Turing machine that accepts this language, one step that accepts this language. We kind of get rid of the crashes so we don't have a crash actually accidentally get us out of this. And we turn the crashes into loop forevers. And eventually, the, if, this, if the word is in this language, then the train machine will accept it. Or if it's in this language, then the train machine will eventually accept it. Of course, if it's in neither, then the train machine might loop forever on it because we changed all crashes to loop forevers. Now, the proof for this theorem is kind of the same thing as if we don't need to run them both at the same time. We just run the Turing machine, uh, the first Turing machine, and then once it accepts, we change it from going into the halt state to transition and start running the second Turing machine on the second input tape with the input word. And then if the second one accepts it, then we know that it's in both L1 and L2 and it can halt.